Welcome to the Acton Institute. Uh, my name is Dan Churchwell. I'm the Director of Programs and Education here at the Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Acton Lecture Series of 2020. We're very thankful for our uh, benefactors who have supplied uh, the funds to underwrite this series of events, and uh, it's a joy to introduce Adam McLeod. Adam McLeod is the professor of law at Faulkner University in Alabama. He's the author of multiple books and peer-reviewed journals, essays, and book reviews all throughout the United States, the United Kingdom, and in Australia. His most recent book, which launches next week, we couldn't make the schedules work, but his brand new book, of which this lecture is based, launches next week. It's called The Age of Selfies, Reasoning About Rights When Stakes Are Personal. And it's available for pre-order right now, and it will launch uh, next week. You can find it at Amazon or Rowan and Littlefield Publishers, and he will explain more about that book later. Uh, Professor McLeod teaches courses concerning property, uh, intellectual property, jurisprudence, and private rights theory. He's also taught at the and been accepted into the James Madison program of graduates, a graduate seminar at Princeton University. He contributes to Journal of News and Public Opinion, such as the Washington Times, the New Boston Post, and Public Discourse. Professor McLeod received his BA from Gordon College and his JD, magna cum laude, from the University of Notre Dame Law School. Professor McLeod lives in Montgomery, Alabama, with the joys of his life, his wife, and five daughters. So please welcome with me, Professor McLeod. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Well, what a joy it is to be back at the Acton Institute. Uh, you know, every time I participate in an Acton event, I always learn more than I teach. Um, if I were a more clever economist, I could come up with a quip about Pareto optimal exchange of knowledge or something. Um, but I'm a lawyer, so we don't do that. Um, I'm here to talk about public discourse and the problems in public discourse today, which is a bit of a dangerous endeavor. Um, it's today, these days, talking about civic discourse is not for the faint of heart, as I'm sure you are aware. On some campuses, notably uh, in recent months, Middlebury College and UC Berkeley, it has actually become a contact sport. And even when it doesn't lead to physical violence, public discussion about important civic questions is often more pain than gain. And so many people, particularly young people I've found, just don't do it. So ask a student whom you know who's enrolled in a high school or a college or a graduate program and who doesn't adhere to the prevailing orthodoxies in that program whether they feel free to challenge those prevailing orthodoxies in the classroom. And I suspect they'll tell you that they don't. Or just reflect on your own experience. Think of a moment recently when you found yourself in a public place where cable news or talk radio or NPR was playing in the background. Um, and think about how you behaved yourself. If you behave as I do in those situations, for example, at a a, a gate terminal uh, subjected to CNN's particular brand of journalism surrounded by strangers. Um, you will try to make yourself as inconspicuous as possible. You'll try to avoid making eye contact with people, keep your, keep your facial expressions as unexpressive as possible, and generally behave uh, like a child might if she accidentally fell into a lion's den at the zoo, um, or maybe someone on the sidelines of a collegiate basketball game in Kansas. Um, I personally particularly try to avoid the guy who's shaking his head and talking about those people. I don't know if I'm one of those people, and I don't want to find out because I left my body armor at home. So we have a problem with public discourse today, and this problem is very complex. I'm going to focus on just one aspect of it. It's an aspect that I explore at some length in this book, The Age of Selfies, which Dan referenced. And the problem that I want to take up is that we express many of, our more, many of our disagreements today on important civic questions in moral terms, as moral disagreements. But in general, we do not understand moral arguments. That's what I think is part of the problem. If I'm right about this, then in the short term, we should stop trying to agree. Our goal should be more modest. We should learn first how to disagree well, how to achieve genuine disagreement. 
And once we've understood our disagreements, I think we will discover that we can live peaceably with each other in spite of many, though not all, of our disagreements. Now, this is not a call to incivility. To the contrary, to be truly civil to each other, we need to understand each other. To state another person's view accurately and disagree with it is far more civil, I think, and far more difficult than to ignore our radical differences. We need to respond to the concerns that actually motivate people, rather than attribute to them motivations that might be far from their minds. We must, in short, learn to disagree well. For some of our substantive differences are so radical that being neighborly just isn't enough. By our language, we indicate that we disagree about non-negotiable principles, what is good and what is evil. We speak to each other as if we are as divided today as Americans were in the 19th century about slavery. So we should not be surprised if our differences defy even our most charitable and best informed efforts to reach consensus. The stakes could not be any more personal. We disagree both about what we should do and about who we are becoming as people. So listen to this bit of practical wisdom from a prominent congresswoman. Quote, the question of marginal tax rates is a policy question, but it's also a moral question. What kind of society do we want to live in? Are we comfortable with a society where someone can have a personal helipad while this city is experiencing the highest levels of poverty and homelessness since the Great Depression? I'm not saying that Bill Gates or Warren Buffett are immoral, but a system that allows billionaires to exist when there are parts of Alabama where people are still getting ringworm because they don't have access to public health is wrong. Now, a generation ago, polite company might have blushed at such talk. Morality was for the church, the synagogue, the family dinner table, maybe the bedroom if you're into that sort of thing. Arguments about moral wrongs were often heard just outside the halls of cultural and political power, mostly from religious conservatives, such as Jerry Falwell's moral majority. But the really important pressing questions of public life were supposed to be resolved exclusively on the basis of neutral reasons, such as democracy, efficiency, and equal protection of the laws. Today, by contrast, the vocabulary and rhetoric of mainstream thought leaders are openly moral. So to put the matter somewhat pointedly, the language of Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, which I just read to you, sounds less like that of former President Bill Clinton than it does like that of former Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore. So the project of civic discourse in our age of moralism, I think, is both pregnant with promise and packed with peril. On one hand, Moral reasoning can be productive, if done well. Discourse about good and evil, right and wrong, has certain advantages over discourse that is confined to neutral political ideals. It gets much closer to the sources of our disagreements, and therefore to what really matters to us. We had our differences during the era of political neutrality, but we stopped achieving genuine disagreement and simply became disagreeable. It's much better, I think, to understand each other's fundamental concerns, to demonstrate mutual respect for each other as human beings, beings who reason about what matters. We must undertake to comprehend and respond to the reasons for which people actually act. We should not attribute to others motivations, results, and consequences they may not intend. So when we encounter, for example, a person who expresses alarm over anthropogenic global warming and wants to cut carbon emissions, uh, we should not, we should take their motivations as we find them. It's fair to point out to the person that there are costs to overreacting, that there are dangers of increasing government's powers, but we should not attribute to them a motivation to be authoritarian. Similarly, when we encounter a person who believes that male and female are given in nature and who cannot in good conscience cater a same-sex wedding, we should not attribute to them an intention to discriminate unlawfully. It is fair to point out that certain people will take their view as expressing moral disapproval or disapproval of them personally. But we should not portray them as a bigot. On the other hand, many practical questions facing us today are not nearly as simple as our moral rhetoric suggests. Reasonable minds disagree about many important questions. And where a practical question admits more than one reasonable answer, to make a moral claim can be a way of cheating. 
to end what should be a longer and more detailed conversation. Moral claims are tempting because they are a superior kind of normative currency. Over and against pragmatic considerations or political ideals, a moral claim is a sort of trump card. To say this is the right thing to do is to say that others are wrong. Maybe they are wrong, but we should have reasons to think so, and we should be open to those reasons. Furthermore, our moralistic expressions today are often personal, sometimes even self-righteous. Moral arguments often concern not only ideas, but also our character as people. They address what is right and wrong to do, and so they contain implicit, sometimes even explicit, judgments about wrong actions. And because wrong actions are performed by people, including many of the people engaged in moral discourse, moral claims often imply personal judgments. As a result, moral discourse often devolves into personal condemnation. Increasingly, we describe each other not only as misguided or mistaken, but as wrong or shameful or even bad people. In fact, doing wrong things can make us bad people. This is a legitimate concern. Someone who lies can become a liar. He who objectifies women can become a sexual predator. Concern for moral integrity is a proper part of moral discourse. But if our moral rhetoric is inflated, then our concern for integrity will also be overwrought. And that harms our discourse. No one, no matter how tendentious his beliefs and vulnerable his opinions, will ever be persuaded by people who convey their belief at front that he is evil. Only a very conscientious and discerning people can avoid the temptation to use moral rhetoric as a weapon. And only a very courageous and learned people can avoid falling prey to its power. The truth is that, on the whole, we are not those people today. I think we're not well equipped for this age of moralism, particularly having pushed moral education out of civic education. We've deprived ourselves and our young people of the resources they need to reason well about the questions that matter today. I think this is an important and overlooked reason why we do not trust our neighbors to hold political and cultural power, to educate our children, to make important decisions in our civic and cultural institutions. One recent controversy illustrates the problem. A debacle ensued when Google announced the launch of an ethics board to guide its responsible development of artificial intelligence, known as AI. This was an admirable effort by Google, aimed at one of the most pressing problems of our time. And that is that many of the decisions that affect our lives, which used to be made by human beings, are now made by AI. AI is a powerful tool that can be used for good or evil. Google did well to commission a diverse board of accomplished thinkers to consider how to prevent AI from violating our basic commitments. But within days of Google's announcement about its advisory board, members of the board began to resign. One of the board members appointed, the president of a conservative think tank, holds the view that men and women are different by nature and are not interchangeable. And she has publicly expressed concern that ratifying the gender identities of men who identify as women might harm the equal rights of women. Some other people hold the view that sex should not determine a person's gender identity, that a biological male must have the right to identify as a woman and be treated as a woman. And reflecting this view, a couple thousand people signed a petition to have the think tank president removed from Google's advisory board. By appointing her to the advisory board, quote, Google elevates and endorses her views, implying that hers is a valid perspective worthy of inclusion in the decision making, the petition asserts. And that, they say, is unacceptable. Notice this charge left Google no neutral ground. The think tank president did not violate anyone's liberty or equality in the classic sense of those ideals. She has a radically different view of human nature and sexuality than her critics. She was willing to serve on Google's board and to discourse with those with whom she disagrees, but she could not in conscience affirm something about human nature she believes to be false or deny something she understands to be true. Now, from the perspective of her critics, her views of human nature are morally illicit, just like the views of racists. It does not matter that she harbors no ill will toward others. The effect of her expressed views 
is that she reflects, is if she refuses to affirm others' gender identities. That sort of intolerance can't be tolerated. Now, these competing views cannot be reconciled. They're inherently incompatible. They are X and not X, like existence and not existence. They cannot both be affirmed. And both views are sincerely held. Some people really believe that a woman is biologically a woman. And others really believe that a woman might be trapped in a male body. Now, until recently, we would have resolved these differences by reference to political and legal principles of liberty and equality. And most people would have shared a common understanding of what those principles are. The principle of liberty, until recently, meant that everyone is presumed innocent and left alone to live their lives until proven otherwise. No one may be subjected to imprisonment or other liability unless and until they're proven to commit a legal wrong. The principle of equality meant that everyone is entitled to equal protection of the laws and that public officials and certain people in public accommodations should not discriminate against people based on immutable personal characteristics, such as race and religious conviction, but only on the basis of actions and choices. As long as the members of Google's advisory board were willing to agree to those principles, and it seems they were, they could address many potential misuses of AI. But that consensus is now unraveled. Many people now think that liberty is not merely a political principle, but also a moral principle. It means not only that everyone should be presumed innocent and left alone to live their lives, but also that everyone should have as many opportunities in life as possible. Whereas under the classical view of liberty, it was enough to refrain from causing wrongs to others, under this new idea of liberty, some people have obligations to provide opportunities for others. The principle of equality has also changed into something more demanding. Unlawful discrimination used to mean intentional discrimination. Thus, one could avoid violating the principle of equality simply by ignoring other people's irrelevant personal traits, such as race and gender dysphoria. As long as we made decisions about others based on their choices and actions, it didn't matter what race they were, what convictions they espoused, or how they identified. Now, many people think that equality has an affirmative aspect. It's not enough to avoid discriminating intentionally. Now, one has an obligation to ensure that one's decisions do not have disparate effects on others. So someone who makes a decision without regard to race might be held responsible for racial discrimination if racial minorities are unintentionally affected by the decision in disproportionate numbers, for example. So equality is taken to mean not just equality of respect, but also equality of result. So in these ways, even our basic commitments to liberty and equality have become morally controversial. In the short term, it's difficult to see any reasoned resolution to our discourse that will satisfy everyone. So the project then, I think, is to rebuild the resources of moral reasoning. We're not going to get anywhere trying to prop up the crumbled edifice of political neutrality. I think this project has three phases, has a number of phases, but in the time remaining, I'm going to discuss three of them, three phases of this rehabilitation project. Each draws resources from something called the natural law tradition. It's an, it's an American tradition affirmed at varying times to varying degrees by John Adams, Abraham Lincoln, Robert Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., and others. But I think it's a tradition that many Americans do not understand well enough today. The first efficiency is moral skepticism. The idea that moral claims do not correspond to or orient the mind toward knowable objective reference. Now, this affliction is most obvious in postmodern theories and practices. Um, obviously, the, the one that everyone calls to mind immediately is intersection, intersectionality theories. Um, but I think it's actually more pervasive. I think it even afflicts some, uh, afflicts some uh, conservative and libertarian groups who reject customs and conventions that enable us to get along in a world of moral indifference and imperfect information. Moral skepticism generally leads to authoritarian proposals. Many moral skeptics want to derive moral imperatives from some theoretical understanding that is available only to members of their groups in a sort of Gnostic sense. And then they want to impose those imperatives on others to whom they're not available by reason. To remedy this deficiency, I think it's enough to pay attention to our own practical reasoning, 
which reveals that we really do believe there are important goods at stake in our public controversies, that we share many of those goods in common, and that we know the value of those goods. The fact is that we all reason about what to do. We all ask practical questions as we go about our lives. And this fact that we ask and answer practical questions reveals that we are not moral skeptics in practice, though we are in theory. For example, philosophers and other experts can articulate lots of clever theoretical arguments that human life is not intrinsically valuable. But notice, in practice, we do not demand a justification of someone who saves another person's life. We see the point of that act in the value of the life saved. We do demand a justification before going to war. And we demand that justification to include as one of its essential premises that human lives will be saved. So that some academics and intellectuals maintain theories of moral skepticism about the value of life does not give us sufficient reason to be skeptical. Practical reasoning is often a surer guide to truth than theoretical reasoning because it's less tolerant of error. If I come to the conclusion that the United States Constitution was ratified in 1890, or that a water molecule is comprised of four atoms, I will be no less wrong than if I conclude that the beef sitting in the back of the refrigerator for the last three months is not rancid. But I will be less sick. So we can begin to make our public discourse more civil and productive by reframing our controversies in less abstract and more practical terms. So consider briefly controversies about immigration reform. As long as we stay at the level of abstract or theoretical reason, it's easy for us to remain in unproductive controversy. Some people on one side insist that the right to immigrate is a fundamental right, and that anyone who supports immigration enforcement lacks sympathy and concern for refugees and the least well-off. Some people on the other side insist that failure to enforce our immigration laws to the letter is a threat to our national security. From here, matters become heated pretty quickly. But notice what happens when we focus on actual cases. So consider the issue as a practical question about which persons should be admitted to our country. Person A is a refugee who suffered religious persecution in his home country. He adheres to an historically peaceful religion, such as Hinduism or Judaism, and has a healthy, intact family. He's well-educated. He's skilled in a useful trade. Person B is a convicted criminal with known terrorist sympathies and no established family commitments. Now put the question, the practical question, whether we should admit or exclude those persons. By comparing these hypothetical applicants for asylum, we expose the implausibility of some of the more extreme abstract claims that people often assert in debates about immigration law. The practical question, what to do about the suspected terrorist, puts to rest the idea that anyone can rationally argue for completely open borders. And it shows that people who advocate for stronger enforcement of immigration laws are not necessarily motivated by hate or bigotry or xenophobia, but they have legitimate concerns. The practical question what to do about the peaceful refugee challenges notions of strict textualism or strict textualist interpretations of law. And it shows that people who advocate for selective enforcement or more equitable enforcement of immigration laws are not necessarily trying to undermine the rule of law, but express legitimate concerns about who we want to constitute ourselves as a people. The second deficiency is the deterioration of our normative currency, what Harvard Law professor Marianne Glendon calls rights talk. We see the inflation of rights rhetoric in a number of different places. For example, the newly discovered right to engage in prostitution, see Canada, or the right to use the internet to poach other people's intellectual property, see France, which are placed on the same footing as the rights not to be maimed, raped, tortured, and murdered. We see it closer to home in the assertion that people have a right to coerce others to affirm their gender identity or lifestyle choices. All of these are called fundamental rights. They're transformed into affirmative claims and entitlements, they proliferate, and they're placed on the same footing as rights not to be wronged or harmed. In fact, they often are used to defeat genuine fundamental rights not to be wronged. The result is we have rights without wrongs. 
They conflict with each other, and they have to be weighed against each other on some measure other than duty and obligation, which, of course, gives judges lots of discretion to go outside the law. Now, the remedy for this deficiency, I think, is to understand what rights are. A right is not essentially an entitlement. A right is instead a direction for the actions of real people who are to decide how they're going to act. To say that someone has a right to free speech means that others have a duty to refrain from, from preventing her from communicating. To say that someone has a right to life is to say that others have a duty not to kill him. To say that one has a right to limbs is to say that others have a duty not to maim. To say that one has a right not to be trafficked is to say that others have a duty not to enslave or sell or buy for sex. As these examples show, a right is an answer to these practical questions that we have. What is to be done? It is a reason, a conclusive reason. A right is what is right to do or to refrain from doing with respect to another person or class of persons or all persons. Its meaning is in identifying what duty I owe the person who's to be affected by my action or failure to act. It binds. It imposes obligation. So in other words, rights guide us to avoid wrongdoing when properly understood. To borrow from the Hebrew in Christian traditions, it forbids us to sin. So properly functioning rights are not primarily about what I am owed or what I am entitled. Rather, they direct my own action toward other people. If everyone were attentive to his or her duties, they would be attentive to other people's rights, and then everyone's rights would be accounted for. Now, many people assert their rights without concern for who bears the burden of responsibility for the right or what is required to vindicate it. I have a right to education right to health care. Um, but again, make the question practical. Tell someone that they have a duty, and they immediately want details. Duty to whom? To do what? Viewing the right from the side of the duty is clarifying. It automatically deflates overinflated assertions of rights. So by examining rights as answers to our practical questions, we can separate real rights from various imposters, which trade on the normative prestige of genuine fundamental rights, and which devalue liberty and equality for all. And we can distinguish different senses of rights, especially the differences between rights that are fundamental and universal and those that are contingent and fact-dependent. So consider again the immigration controversy. We can all agree that people should be at liberty to leave their homeland when they're being murdered and oppressed there. But that does not entail that any person has a legal claim to enter any country they want. Any duty to admit them would depend upon the laws of the country they desire to enter. So the liberty to emigrate is universal. The right to immigrate is contingent on the particular laws of the country and of particular states. The third deficiency is the thinning out of moral reasoning into moral imperatives or commands. Our civic discourse is so rancorous in part because too much is at stake. If every important question is a zero-sum contest between competing proposals, then someone's proposal must always lose, and the losers must then be governed by the victors. And the victors, of course, remember, are people whom the losers considered to be not only objectionable, but unreasonable, or even wrong. But that's if. What if most of our controversies need not be zero-sum contests? What if we can live out many of our differences reasonably? To achieve the pluralism that can enable us to live together in spite of our differences, we need to employ what I call in the book the power of indifference. Most of our practical questions admit of more than one possible reasonable answer. These are questions of what Thomas Aquinas called determinatio. Common law jurists following Aristotle called the matters of indifference. Not meaning that we should be indifferent toward the result, but rather meaning that the right answer can be settled and specified in more than one way equally consistent with reason. Not all answers will be equally reasonable. 
But unlike questions of absolute rights, matters of indifference allow us to disagree within reason. People have absolute rights, and they're important. We all have exceptionless duties not to enslave, defame, and kill. And so we all have absolute rights not to be enslaved or defamed or killed. But as long as we stay within those moral boundaries, marked off by those exceptionless duties, we have great freedom to settle on particular duties of action and the rights that will correlate with them. Parents and teachers, for example, have obligations to educate and care for children. But not everyone must educate their children or students the same way, or feed them the same food. Most important questions, I think, in our day are matters of indifference, despite the heated moral rhetoric often attached to them. This means that they are questions about which reasonable minds can disagree, or which are contingent on variable circumstances. Not all illegal immigrants are equally culpable. Not all business owners who refuse to celebrate same-sex relationships are discriminating because of sexual orientation. States need not have identical tax laws. States can use different laws to disincentivize abortion and protect the health of mothers from unscrupulous abortionists. Different schools and colleges can pursue different forms of knowledge and by different means. In short, we can have, to some degree, pluralism. And I think we can and should encourage different groups and communities of people to explore a variety of different answers to many of our practical questions and different solutions to our problems, as long as they don't infringe absolute fundamental rights or commit inherent wrongs. And I recognize there's a complication about what that means. But I think allowing a greater variety of options and more freedom to choose between them would return practical reasoning to the domain of the practical. It would avoid many zero-sum contests, would lower the stakes of our disagreements, and it would likely lower the temperature of our discourse. And I think this is how human beings generally flourish. For a people to flourish in all the diverse aspects of our well-being, the common good, they must be free to choose, to some extent, a plurality of projects. For that to happen, governments and politics must be kept in their place. We can lower the stakes of our public controversies, lower the temperature of our civic discourse, and avoid zero-sum contests over totalizing plans of action if we will allow the plural domains of society to do their work. Now, to do this, we need to rehabilitate the norms and institutions that stand guard around the plural domains of society, which produce these different goods. I have in mind specifically vested property rights, conscience protections, and religious liberty. And I've written quite a bit about that in other contexts. So learning how to disagree well, I think, is just the beginning. I hope it's just the beginning. But now I'm out of time, so I'm going to put on my body armor and get ready for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor McLeod. Appreciate that. Uh, so now we have about 30 minutes of Q&A, where you're uh, more than welcome to ask any sorts of questions uh, that you'd like. But we would ask that you would please raise your hand and then wait until my, myself or my colleague come and hand you a microphone, because we have folks who are watching this via live stream that would love to hear your question as well. And if you talk without a microphone, they won't be able to catch that. So does anyone have any questions? How do we um, get practical morality uh, education brought to American high schools? <laughs> to American high schools, yeah. Um, obviously a big question. Uh, I don't teach high school, so I'll, I'll start there. Uh, I teach in a law school. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll begin with my own experience. Um, my experience over the years, the, I've been teaching 13 years, not that long, but long enough to see a sort of general trend in the students who have come to our law school over the last decade plus. Um, the trend isn't good on the whole um, in terms of their knowledge base and their capacity to, to reason with each other. Um, uh, and one of the things that we did at our law school was develop a required first semester course that we call Foundations of Law, which is essentially a course in historical and analytical jurisprudence where the students are required to read the books drawn out of the great tradition that many people are familiar with, 
um, that just aren't required anymore, uh, that students, in fact, had never encountered in our experience. Um, basic texts such as Hebrew and Christian scriptures, Aristotle's ethics, Aquinas' treatise on law. Um, uh, what was more shocking to me, the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the Constitution of the United States, students hadn't encountered. So I think just getting them to engage the, the great tradition of Western thought is, is hugely important and hugely valuable. Um, and in my experience, um, that often opens up conversations that students didn't know they were even capable of. Um, so I guess I'm just making the case for the great books. Uh, but I, I do think, actually, in my experience, um, it goes quite a long way. Now, you have to set guidelines. You have to motivate the students to actually want to have the conversation. Um, that's, that's hard. Um, uh, um, and there's a, there's a bigger conversation to be had around that, but maybe we can start there. Hi. Um, seeing as most of our, um, our, our sources for uh, information and connection come through mass media forms of one, one form or the other, and, and that those tend to be really polarized these days for whatever reasons, is there anything optimistic on the front as far as the, the media uh, agreeing that they need to be a little bit more objective and find a center ground, or are we still, we have a long way to go yet? Yeah. So um, I, I, guess, I guess I want to um, maybe challenge the idea that, that uh, sort of uh, centralist or objective or neutral media ought to be our objective. Um, I, I think that was the way that meant, you know, sort of Walter Cronkite model of journalism. Um, it's gone. I just think it's gone. Um, and I'm, I'm inclined, this might be overstating it a bit, but I'm inclined to say good riddance, um, in part because I think that the era of political neutrality, sort of a Rawlsian public liberalism, um, masked a lot of really radical differences which were there all along. And what it did was it, it said, if you bring your moral views into this conversation, you're, you're smuggling in illicitly uh, you know, more controversial moral ideas, when in fact, Rawlsian public liberalism itself rested on illicit moral uh, conceptions of the good. And so, um, so I don't think, I think, in other words, I think the neutrality that, uh, that was sort of held up as the model in our political culture and journalism and so forth um, was actually a bit of an illusion. Um, now, there's a new challenge, and that, as you point out, is what to do about polarization. If everyone's sort of gone into their camps and they're not talking with each other, uh, that's a real problem. Um, I, I'm not an expert in media, so I don't know how much of that is just, that's the internet, right? Um, uh, and, and that much of this could be resolved by more face-to-face -face interactions, attending lectures such as this. Uh, so I don't know how much of it is um, the form of the media or the, and how much of it is the substance of the media. I just don't know. Um, but I do think that, uh, that if we listen carefully to what other people are saying, particularly people with whom we disagree, I think we will find that there is a common shared commitment there. And that is that whatever, whatever their differences, Roy Moore and uh, AOC genuinely believe that there is a right and wrong. So let's start there. Um, and, and that's, I think, actually an opportunity. It's a challenging opportunity, but I think it's an opportunity. Uh, I'm interested in your rights, duties, responsibility triangle that you talked about. Uh, if it all works together, we have kumbaya. But you're talking about polarization. And you're talking about the, you know, the civil uh, discourse. What are the steps we need to take to improve uh, this, this, this uh, triangle so that we can respect each other's rights and perform the duties and have the responsibilities to be a more civil society? Uh, yeah, a great question, big question. Um, I think the first step, as I tried to indicate, is to understand rights not as fundamentally um, first person focused. So I think there's quite a lot of work to be done in understanding uh, that there is a rights tradition which goes all the way back, both in common law and civilian jurisdictions, to Justinian um, and beyond Justinian. Um, uh, it's, it's been around for centuries. And we can draw upon that tradition 
if we will use it well to understand rights as the just thing to do. So I, this goes back to the earlier question about educating high school students. Um, if you get them to read, say, um, the dialogue between um, uh, Socrates and Credo um, and understand uh, Socrates' argument that um, what is the just thing to do is not what I am owed, but fundamentally what I owe to my community because I've enjoyed the benefit of, of its laws um, and its protection for myself and my family. So I think shifting that perspective around from what I am owed to what I owe others I think is the first step. Um, and the, the resources for that are, are all through the tradition. Um, in fact, it's, it's only very, very recently that rights have, have adopted this sort of exclusively first person um, uh, direction. So just getting them to read old books, I think, is a pretty good step. Um, but I think the second part is uh, challenging um, uh, assertions of rights claims on moral grounds. To what good end is a right to engage in prostitution directed? Right? I mean, in fact, the laws which prohibited prostitution in Canada before they were struck down were protecting the rights of young women not to be trafficked, the right not to do wrong. That's an important right which secures an important human good, bodily integrity, moral integrity. Um, so just challenging rights talk on more fundamental moral grounds. Um, and I think what you'll often find is people who are asserting those rather tendentious rights claims, they don't have anything to say. They've never thought about it, right? Because it's always worked. I just assert that I have a right to this, and everyone sort of defers. I think we just need to stop deferring. We need to do it politely, right? But just stop deferring. It shouldn't be a trump card anymore. Thank you. I'd be interested in hearing what you would tell your Faulkner Law School students, um, how you uh, speak about um, the trial in the Senate right now, how you would have them evaluate that, how you translate that for them. Well, they're law students, so um, obviously uh, we're going to focus on um, constitutional questions, uh, questions of um, uh, legislative procedure, the Senate's rules, uh, the way that the Senate constructs its rules um, and follows, adheres to its rules. Um, but personally, I, I would want to go more deeply. So I would want to talk about questions such as, um, what does it mean to take an oath of office? When I take the oath of office, whether that's a president of the United States, chief justice of the United States, United States senator, am I merely agreeing to stay within the black letter of the rules and then push those rules as far as I can without breaking the black letter? Or is, is the oath of office in fact a moral act? Am I in fact taking upon myself a moral obligation? A moral obligation which uh, requires me to understand law not merely as the set of black letter rules, but, as, uh, but, but understand, understand law as a moral enterprise. And to the extent that I am usurping um, uh, or, or pushing the boundaries of the law, in fact, I am potentially harming that moral enterprise in which we all share. So that's a conversation that I would want to have with my law students. In fact, it is a conversation I have with them all the time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to teach at a university where I'm allowed to have those conversations and no one bats an eyelash. Um, not everyone's so fortunate. You mentioned about having a conversation and the importance of that, sitting down and kind of talking through things. Um, on some level, I wonder, are we almost past the ability to have that? Um, even that kind of, that civil discourse. I, even, in, even in places where, enshrined in our, in our communities where this ought to take place, university forums, a lot of times it's there that we're finding greater hostility to even being able to have that, where people are shouting down and don't allow speakers to, to even present it. Um, you know, on some level you said, well then you just have to, we have to start pushing back. And uh, so are we at that point almost where, where things are devolving to the point where both sides are, you know, the one side saying, we're tired of this, we're gonna push back which eventually, on some level, brings us back to American history with the Civil War almost, where you eventually got to a divide where 
the two sides aren't able to have good communication yeah. sitting down anymore, and now you're just sh almost shouting at each other. And then it's, okay, who is the stronger army and who is going to win because the war of ideas has broken down, so now we're going to have to have a war of, of strength. I mean, when, when, does, when do you as a society get to the point where you've broken down so much that the areas where you're supposed to be able to have civil discourse, you can't even have that, yeah. like in the halls of Congress or in, uh, in our academia. When you can't have that, um, w where can we have that? Um, and, or can't we? Do we have to fight it out through force of arms? Um, so I'm just a lawyer, so your penultimate question, when, when does this devolve into civil war, I think is a bit above my pay grade. But let me try to take up a couple of the other themes you touched on there. Um, so one is, I, I want to clarify what I mean by pushing back. Um, if, if, if I use that phrase, what I mean is to not accept um, the, 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 the bare assertion of a right or some poli putatively politically neutral principle, but instead to interrogate what is the moral foundation of that assertion? What good is this, is this um, advancing or, or pursuing? Um, so yeah, so I think actually there are um, theories, groups of people who actually uh, are quite set against civil discourse, and I don't think we're going to make, make much progress with many of them. I mentioned inter intersectionality theories. Um, uh, it, it, it just so happens that I, fin I spent seven months this year researching post-structuralist philosophy and intersectionality theories for a, another book I'm working on. Um, and it's pretty dark stuff. Um, you know, they, they really genuinely believe that there are no external reference for, uh, for sim symbols and, and claims and assertions, that everything is, is constructed of relativistic discursive regimes and all this sort of stuff. Um, you, you're not going to get very far reasoning with someone like that. Um, so I think we just have to accept that there are some people we're not going to make much progress with. But here's been my experience. I've had a lot of students um, who've come into my classroom who begin the year spouting off all these intersectionality theories. I call them all the isms. They love isms, right? Which is just really a shorthand, uh, sort of a shortcut around rational thought, right? I can just slap a label on it and I don't have to think about it. Um, I can just sort of dismiss you. Um, a lot of students who come in with all the isms, um, and the problem fundamentally is not that they believe it, but that they've never encountered anything different, right? They've literally never read, don't assume that they've read the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> right? Don't assume that they've encountered Aristotle. Um, don't assume that they've ever read the Bible, right? Um, so I think, they, I think just what, what I've found is that the moment you start to illumine their ignorance, a lot of that just dissolves. Um, and so I actually have great hope if we can restore moral uh, education as part of civic education um, that, we'll, that we'll see a, 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 lot of this, a lot of this improve. Um, just one anecdote, uh, I, you know, I'm sometimes asked to serve as sort of the token conservative on a, a panel of law professors and, you know, or, or academics someplace. And I distinctly remember um, a time I was asked it was at the height of the debates, debates over same-sex marriage to serve on a panel at Suffolk Law School um, as the token uh, 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 conservative. Um, and it was what you'd expect. I mean, there was quite a lot of hostility. Um, but the students in that room, and the room was packed, had just never heard the argument for natural marriage. They just never encountered it. And so they just assumed that anyone who opposes the re redefinition of marriage is a bigot. Now, they probably still thought I was a bigot when they left the room, but at least they had encountered the argument, and maybe I'm just a rational bigot, right? Um, but what I found was, as soon as the event ended, I was surrounded by a cluster of students. And the quick discussion very quickly moved off the question of marriage to the, to the more fundamental question, is there truth and how do we know it? And now we're having a real conversation. And by the way, afterward, when I got back to my, uh, my home institution a couple weeks later, I, I had the sweetest uh, most beautifully written thank you note from the LGTB Law Students uh, Society at that law school. Um, just that I was willing to come and, you know, and, and have that conversation with them. So yeah, a, a lot of people in the audience, uh, you're, you're not going to get very far with them. But in my experience, there's always at least someone who's watching to see how you handle this. And there's going to be opportunities there. I agree with the, <coughs> the last question there about uh, being pessimistic, but uh, I've, re I've 
like Steve Bannon. I, I think he's a square shooter, and he talks about populism, and that's maybe the only way that uh, we'll ever get back to somewhat typical. What answer? So, um, so populism, uh, like all isms, I'd want to know what <laughs> what we mean by it. So I think I. Yeah, so the, he's he's referring to Brexit, uh, as I understand, and other other movements uh, uh, which are um, uh, aimed at uh, sort of recapturing self governance from far off elites and central governments and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll show my hands here. I think on balance, um, uh, uh, Brexit is a, is probably going to be a good thing. Um, I'm not a Brit, so I'm you know that's not an educated statement. That's just sort of a uh, mildly educated statement um, and somewhat detached. Um, and I think the reason is because uh, the, the more we have opportunities for self-governance, the more practical reasoning we have to do, right? The more we have opportunities for self-governance, the more we're required to ask of ourselves really hard, important questions. What is the right thing to do in this circumstance? And that activity is is self-constituting, it's reflexive, it builds our muscles, right? We develop the habits and the virtues of thinking reasonably um, and, and solving our own problems. Um, and so a big part of this, as I, as I mentioned at the end of the talk I just gave, is the centralization of power um, in far off distant um, capitals um, is a big threat to ordered liberty and civic discourse. Um, because it, 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 it atrophies our practical reasoning muscles. Um, so if that's what we mean, on the whole, I'm in favor of it. Now, I think it can be taken to extremes. Um, you know, when counties start seceding from states um, because they just can't agree on tax policy, you know, this is a trend that I think we need to arrest. Um, um, but, but again, I think this, this sort of model can go a long way toward, toward arresting it. I think you're absolutely right about illuminating their ignorance. I, I find that uh, a lot of young people today, like you say, do not have the basic reading uh, references. And, um, but what happens is, because you're illuminating their ignorance, they tend to get more emotional in their arguments because they don't know the subject matter and they know they don't know it, so then out comes, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're... Yeah. And um, what do you do when someone starts calling you names? Um, so uh, this is an another reason um, that I often get myself into trouble. I believe in authority. I believe in natural authority. Um, and my view is that when I'm standing in front of the classroom, um, I have authority over my students. The reason is grounded in a good. It's the important good of acquiring knowledge. Um, if we're going to acquire knowledge in that classroom setting, someone has to have the authority to coordinate our actions and decide that certain words, certain phrases, certain actions are out of bounds. So isms, no isms. I don't allow my student to start any sentence with the, word I f with the words I feel, right? It goes, I mean, it's a, it's a trivial thing, but it actually goes a long way. Um, uh, I actually have a, a really good friend who teaches at Calvin College who has the same rule. Um, uh, and I think probably for the same reason. Um, I, I think, in other words, uh, this goes part and parcel with what I was referring to earlier, um, that, that the idea that uh, we just sort of um, defer to assertions of status or, or, or rights um, is, is become problematic. Um, and to get them to think critically about what are we trying to do here? What are we as a group trying to do here? We have a practical problem to solve, and that is how to learn. How are we going to learn? Well, we're not going to learn if we just call each other names. So for that reason, whether or not you agree with it, I'm not going to let you call each other names. Um, some people find that uncomfortable. I confess that I don't. <laughs> Maybe that's a deficiency on my part. Uh, but I think it goes a long way. Just, just exercising natural authority goes a long way, in my experience. You know, what you're describing sounds so much uh, to me 
like what we've seen in the past 75 years in our legal system, and that is elevating what are general what were generally thought as public policy questions, things to which you know uh, people can disagree, elevating the answer to one of a constitutional in nature. It's a legal problem. This is now this can't be this can't be debated anymore. It's no longer right. a political question. Um, I, I guess first question: Do you agree with that? And if so, how how do you think that that has informed this new way of thinking, where we we always want to elevate things to that next level, take it out of the out of the um, um, sphere to which you know, reasonable people can can debate it and argue it? Yeah. So I, I definitely see the concern to the extent that law is one of those neutral reference to which we all used to be able to refer. Um, does it sound like I'm, I'm proposing something in public discourse analogous to what's done by judicial activists? Is that, is that yeah, so, okay, so, um, no, by no means. I mean, here's the reason, because I think law itself uh, is part of that tradition which I referenced. Law itself is a moral enterprise. It has, it, it, in law, it, and I think we need to understand what we mean by law. So when I speak of law, I don't mean the text. I don't even just mean the propositions contained in the text. Um, I'm referring to a tradition which goes back centuries, which consists not only of our positive laws, our statutes and our regulations, but all of the customary norms and natural uh, norms of natural law that we have understood ourselves to be governed by for centuries. Um, it also includes private law, all of the contracts and property conveyances. Um, in other words, law is far more complicated than just the text. And if you understand that, you suddenly discover in the law all sorts of resources, to, uh, 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 resources that, are, that contain practical wisdom within them. So in other words, I think the study of law in that more comprehensive sense, of, which includes both customary law and natural law and private law, as well as the positive text, and understanding the positive text as either declaring or even in some cases changing in some respects but not others, those more ancient sources of law, um, actually is a tremendous resource for us. So I think actually judicial activists are on the other side of this question insofar as they want to ignore law as a, as a, a rich source of practical reasons for our, our deliberations. Yeah. How do you improve discourse at Faulkner? I mean, obviously, you've got a bunch of young people who have been staring at a phone for 15 years. Yeah. Do you, I don't know, institute a, an in-house uh, debate teams or something along that line? Or how do you improve the way that they communicate face-to-face? -face? Um, practically speaking, I do have colleagues who ban laptops in the classroom. Um, those who do, by the way, swear by it. So students check their laptops and their phones at the door. Um, I haven't gone that far, um, but we've, I think, done a pretty good job at Faulkner of cultivating uh, a culture where people are expected to talk with each other um, and um, pay attention. Um, I mean, obviously, law school has sort of built-in incentives because they want to pass the bar exam. So, um, you know, so they, you know, I, I, they're, they're kind of a captive audience. Um, maybe it gets more complicated in the college setting and especially in the high school setting. Um, so I'm not sure I have much practical wisdom to offer there. Um, but again, I would go back to the exercise of authority. I think it's up to the teacher to decide uh, what they need to do and, and maybe sometimes make hard decisions um, about what they need to do to break addictions to technology, for example, and so forth. Yeah. Let's give Professor McLeod a round of applause, Thank please. You. Mm -hmm. Thanks.